Welcome back to Talking Transitions. Today's guest is one of my best mates and current Wrexham footballer, Anthony Ford. Fordy is from a small village in Ireland called Ballangarry. He's a Ballangarry fanatic. He doesn't let anyone say anything bad about it. <laughs> but I've Googled it and there's not much there at all. Not much at all. So talk us through being from Ballangarry and being probably the only sports person to come out of it, never mind playing the Premier League. It's a very small village, John. Um, <laughs> not much going on there, to be fair. Uh, I left when I was 15, so it's been a long time now. But uh, yeah, I absolutely love it and um, love going back there. Don't know if I'd move back there. Um, but we have these conversations all the time. Yeah, but no, I love it. It's not much going on, but it's a small community that everyone knows everyone and uh, we're all really close or whatever. And, you know, I... I um, I don't think I'll move back, but family and friends are mean a lot to me. So when I do go back, it's great. And are you the only footballer to come from Balangadi? Um, yeah, I am. Yeah, got a statue when he goes back. Well, that's what I was gonna say. When you made your Premier League debut, did you get walked around on a horse or something around the village, like a little knighthood? No, John. Oh. <laughs> I just see, <laughs> I just see Balangadi as like a little small village. No, It'll it's um. When I made my debut and stuff like that, everyone, you know, I was the talk of the town or whatever, but, and when I came home... He loves that. He loves that. No, I don't. No. <laughs> and when I when I go home, everyone obviously knows me and they're proud or whatever, and that's a nice feeling, going back there, because, you know, just moving away, the sacrifices or whatever, and then people obviously follow me. But talk us through, 15-year-old getting scouted for Wolves, how it works, obviously, how you first got scouted from Ireland and then moving over? Uh, so I spent my county team at home in, in Limerick and got scouted by Villa when I was 12. Then went back and forward to England to different clubs and I signed with Wolves when I was 14. I think I was 14, yeah, and I moved over fully when I was 15 then, so left home obviously. 15, moved in with a family in uh, Wolverhampton, and uh, yeah, went from there really. Did, Wo did Wolves have um, like a scout dedicated to Ireland? Because there seemed to be like a lot of players who made that transition similar to yourself. Um, yeah, there was a there was a scout from Dublin, and uh, he, I think it was with Ireland or Fifteens. He was he spotted me playing. Um, but usually, there's scouts from most clubs in in different parts of Ireland, and Usually when the big big competitions are on or the underage Irish games and stuff like that, there'll there'll always be a handful of them there. Well, loads of them there really. Yeah. Um, and that's how I got to Wolves or whatever. But um, yeah, it was s strange looking back now, moving over so young. But it was amazing as well at the same time. Well, you've been in England now for half your life, like you said before. But the sacrifices you made to come over at fifteen obviously paid off. You made your Premier League debut. <laughs> Four Wolves, um, talk us through that. Yeah, I think um, at the time I was probably uh, close to my family or whatever, but I thought if I moved to the right family, it would it would help me, do you know what I mean? Um, and moving to Wolves, that was a big decision. Um, and part of signing for them was because of the family. I still speak to them now, you know that, like, whatever. Um, but it was... Making my debut was obviously that that was the best reward probably I've had because I thought if I'm moving away, I'm not moving away to fail. Do you know what I mean? I was thinking some days, some weeks uh, in, in training when I'm that young, I'm thinking, fucking hell, like this is hard. Do you know what I mean? But I always thought in my head, I've moved away for a reason. Like I need to put everything into it. And uh, when, I, when I made my debut, um, running on the pitch, literally, I remember after the game thinking like, you know that's what it's all about that's it's obviously i'm lucky it paid off for me but yeah. i also put in as much work as i could yeah you answer and yeah. um, was it against chelsea debut chelsea yeah uh, um my debut i came on i think it was the last 15 minutes um literally i remember mick mccarthy was the manager he said to want me to warm up and kind of shit myself to be honest like, yeah. how old <laughs> uh, i was 18, 18. just turned 18. And um, I remember warming up. I think Lampard was warming up beside me or something. I was just thinking, what's going on here? 
Um, and then he called me to to come on and remember just running on. I still remember running on and Ashley Cole was left back. And I remember just turning and like looking up the stand and I was just thinking, this is just insane. How, what am I doing Surreal, on this yeah. pitch here? But yeah, absolutely loved every minute. It was an unbelievable experience. Um, yeah, and proud of it, like obviously. Did the club, you know, obviously with you being so young and showing a lot of promise, as you said, you was with a different family. Um, you maybe weren't getting the same guidance that you would from your own, mm -hmm. but did the club kind of look after you in that sense or was the, the family that you kind of went and lived with, was they good good for your like development as well as? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was blessed to be put in with that family. And uh, when I went on trial there, I'd stayed with them. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying when I got home, if, if I signed there, I need to be living there. And they they said the same. They actually said that they want, if I do sign, they wanted to, me to stay with them. And... um. It was like moving from home to another home, kind of. They made me feel, you know, you some lads, they, they go to digs and they just stay in their bedrooms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. I would be in the living room with them all the time. I'd do everything with them. Um, and, you know, they, they had experience of having young lads before, so, like, they could guide me. And um, I grew, grew up, um, well, I matured quite a lot at that age and I remember like it was different because when I go home my family would see a difference in me and stuff like that but I think you have to kind of mature mm -hmm. quick yeah. when you're when you're coming through yeah. uh, to, to try to get the first team level and stuff like that. You you moved out quite young as well. Yeah didn't you? I moved out but mom was different so I didn't move in with a family I moved in to like a college it was like 22 of us the youth team at Shrewsbury mm. and then two years that I was living in there that was the best time of my life. Yeah. We didn't have like a family, so we had to mature quickly because we just living with ourselves. We had to cook for ourselves. We had to learn how to cook and all that. So that was a great experience for me. And honestly, from 31 years old now, but played obviously football for 14 years or so now professionally, but then two years in the youth team were definitely the best years yeah, of my life. When you look back at it, a lot of clubs did that with uh, the youth team. They had a lot of like big houses or houses, whatever. Yeah. That Preston, all Preston the lads used to stay together. Right. But... Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you're obviously mixing with different characters yeah, and, yeah. and different personalities. And yeah. I mean, I don't know about yourselves, but at that age, I probably wasn't mature enough to yeah. to keep developing professionally as a footballer. Um, but then you do see the players; you kind of stand out. And um, I can't remember if I saw somebody talking about Zinchenko, and it was just kind of he was he was basically you could he was destined for what he was going to do. Mm. Um, did you find that was the a few years coming through at the same time, and Wolves were kind of maturing you all together or was it like Anthony's going to be a, a player we need to make sure that we're looking after him and, and giving him the you know the opportunity to thrive basically um I think what helped me was moving over I moved over a year before my scholarship started so I was under 16s but I was in full time with the U team mm -hmm. and I remember sometimes thinking geez I'm so far off it like even at that age but I'd never had the coach in that these lads had or whatever but after a while I just grew like and got better um quite quick really and uh, I remember the UT manager Mick Halsall was unbelievable with me um and all of a sudden I went from like not even playing the U team to literally going into playing a reserve game and like standing out when I was younger and uh I remember like the the first team coaches obviously spotted that and liked it and I always had a good attitude and I remember I I was a little rake when I came over like I couldn't <laughs> even do one pull up you're not a rake now like, <laughs> you? and uh, yeah I just battered the gym I was in there all the time I remember like you know how competitive it is as yeah, well. and yeah. I remember some lads were like what are you doing in the gym again being busy for yeah exactly and I was yeah. like I'll take it. Like, it's yeah. mad how people see it as busy, isn't it? Just trying yeah. to become better and help yeah. yourself become better. So I think it it's is. that like, environment in football, isn't it? Um, and I, I, I remember lads were like, busy fucker, like, mm. and all this. And I was thinking, in my head, I was an arse. Like, yeah, good, that's like, good. I, I was like, I'll take it because I know I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to not do it because you don't want me in there because mm -hmm. it looks better for, for me. Because mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. But... Yeah, I, I put in a lot of hard work and um, 
I remember getting moved up to uh, the Resis and playing a lot with them, and then I got moved into the first team dressing room early. Um, and even like, obviously, when I knew that they they wanted me to push on, was you know, like you've college on Wednesdays and stuff, and mm-hmm. I'd get pulled out of college to train with the first team yeah. sometimes. And I'm, I think, looking back, I did when I was that age. Every time I trained with the first team. I always trained really well, like, and, um, yeah, I think they just, they liked my attitude, um, which was, I think, a big bonus as well, um, but, yeah, I think, looking back now, there were so many good players, yeah. like, that are, have great careers now and everything, and um, I, I skipped past a lot of them yeah. at the time, which I look back now and think, Jeez, I must have I must have been doing well. Yeah. Did that breed confidence when you made that transition over to the first team and you was like you was holding your own? Well not only holding your own, you was doing well and as you say, skipping past some of those players. Did did you feel a bit more confident in yourself after that? Yeah, I did. I remember there was a stage and I thought like I'm flying. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And even training with them and whatever. I just felt I felt when I trained with them, I trained better because I was at had to uh, go up to their level. Mm-hmm. But the thing then is the experience of playing games it's totally different yeah exactly it's, that's when you get the the shock and that's why players go on loan when they're younger to get that experience and i didn't go on loan i wasn't left going loan when i was around the first team back then and it was great because i probably wouldn't have changed it but it probably would have helped me if i did go on loan earlier mm-hmm. um but absolutely no regrets i'm lucky that I, I made my debut at Wolves and it was an unbelievable club. What would you say to a um, young Irish lad or someone else from over the country uh, coming over to England? I'd be hesitant, a bit scared to move away from the family and all that at such a young age. I think the the advice I give him is you're going over for yourself. Um, you know, you're leaving your family, your friends. You don't want to go over and start doing getting sucked into a group of lads that maybe you shouldn't or you're there for a reason make the most of it because i know a lot of lads that that moved over and they were really good really talented players but the margin to make it is that small that um a lot had to go back back home and then you're when you leave ireland most people leave after their junior cert so there's still um a few years left in school and uh you know, if if you don't make it, you end up having to go home, and then you you have to go back to college to, and then you're behind people at home, and it, luckily for me, I didn't have to do that. But I, that must be mentally really hard at that age because you think I failed, but sometimes look, it, it doesn't work out, and I always had in my head that I can't imagine going home, thinking, oh, he hasn't made it because there there's people there that don't want you to succeed. Yeah. Like, and there's jealousy because you're at a young age and you're this footballer going over to England. Um, people want you to, people do want you to fail. It's simple as that. That's that's the world we live in. Mm. And I remember thinking, I'm not failing. Like, I'm not going home early here. So um, it fueled you, basically. Yeah, it kind of fueled me a bit. And I'm, you know, I just thought I want to kick on. And I, the last thing I need is... is uh, not making it basically going back to that Ballingardy must have been scary if you didn't make it mate there's only about 10 people in there John you haven't even been to Ballingardy but I'm coming in the summer <laughs> you were there in the summer so I'm coming in the summer whoever's listening to this from Ballingardy I know you're, <laughs> you're waiting for him I know <laughs> he's talked to me about he can't wait for me to go to this Ballingardy right and I've googled it and things to do in Ballingardy there's nothing there's no, honestly nothing there there's a few pubs there is there <laughs> no, I'm ready to do a good you'd be happy then yeah, but it's, 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 a, it's a it's a great spot, but there's there's not a lot going on there. The people make it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> More people like you. Right, we're gonna skip forward about thirteen years ago, for two thousand twenty two, when you was playing for Oxford, and you made the decision to drop down two divisions to stand for Wrexham in the National League. Talk us through why you made that decision. Um, at the time at Oxford, I wasn't really playing as much as I wanted. Um. I still had a year left, um, and I had a phone call from Wrexham, and I, th- I th- kind of thought, I know they're a big club, but at, at first I was like, I'm not sure. 
so I had a phone call with the manager and um, you know he, he spoke to me about everything and where the club could go and whatever but um, I, I really liked him after speaking to him basically and I was like the only thing that I didn't want to do was drop down yep. and I was dropping down from league one to the conference like um, and then I just thought you know what like I was 28, 29 can't remember but I just thought I'm at that age now why not go and try something different exciting go and try win the league somewhere and be a part of it and play every week and I just thought like my ego probably was the only thing stopping yeah. me because I was like oh, I'm better than that I'm dropping down but when I moved it was the best decision I made um, we'll, because we'll get on to that because it has turned out the best decision mm-hmm. but from people from the outside like I spoke to Andre yesterday and he said, like, we was talking about what we're going to speak about and stuff like that. And he said, well, obviously he's dropped down for the money. And people will probably think that, but as a mate, obviously I know that weren't the reason why he dropped down. I was trying to explain, like, obviously he weren't really playing at Oxford and the opportunity to come to go and play games at Wrexham. Yeah. And this was before, like, the hype around Wrexham now. There weren't really much hype around Wrexham at the time. So, like, it was a, it was a big decision back then to drop down them two divisions, where now, obviously... Because the hype around Wrexham, everyone wants to go to Wrexham now. Mm. But at the time when you made the, um, made that decision to go, it went like that. It was a tough decision. But like you said, it's worked out to be the best decision you've ever made. And as a mate, I'm made up that you've done it as well. I think because you've played at such a high level as well, maybe, obviously, it would be really difficult to get back to those levels, maybe. So as you say, try something yeah. different, you know. Yeah. You know, try and win a league, try and get promoted back-to-back, maybe. Yeah. Um that can be enticing. And obviously what, when you've talked to the manager, that's kind of a big thing as well for a player. Mm. When you go into a club, you know, you've got to have a good relationship with the manager ultimately. Yeah. So obviously he sold you kind of the club and the vision that they've got. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Obviously um, we've all seen snippets, you know, on, on the social sides and stuff, but you're, you're in it day, day to day. Um, what makes it so special? I think um, one of the things was, I knew they hadn't been out in the league in 15 years and I thought if we go in, if I go in basically and I'm a part of that and, you know, we, we do get promoted, you'll be loved and it it would feel amazing and I knew that the big support but I didn't realise until I got there, like the first home game was 10,000 and louder than most clubs I've been yeah. played under basically. Mm-hmm. The atmosphere is unbelievable and it it didn't feel like I had dropped down when I was playing at home. Um, there was a lot of uh, away games that obviously are different, but I think um, I spoke to one of the lads, Elliot Lee, one of my teammates, and he'd been at Oxford with me, and uh, the gaffer spoke to him about me as well, and I was just like, oh, what's it like? And he was like, I'm only here a few weeks. He signed before me, but he was like, it's good, like, um, it's early days yet, but, you know, it could be the start of... A special journey or whatever and i just thought yeah i, I want to be part of it and i um you know i didn't think it would be as big as what it is now but i suppose taking the chance if we didn't get promoted last year like we did it, it wouldn't be as a uh, as exciting for me or i wouldn't feel like the club obviously the, the club were under not under pressure but they were expected to get out of the league as well um so to come and uh get promoted last year now be doing well this year is is great and obviously you can see all the the exposure they're getting that first year for you um trying to get promoted and obviously trying to play and get promoted was a tough year personally for you um started off obviously with should have been the best time of your life yeah obviously the birth of paddy your son um talk us through the events obviously of that and then what come of it after them? Yeah, Paddy Paddy was born on uh the fourth of Feb and um yeah, it was great playing every week, you know, winning. Um then he was born, so I was obviously probably the highest I've yeah. been to be fair, like, you know, when you you've a little boy now yeah, as well, definitely, yeah. And best feeling in the world. And I remember just thinking, you know, things things are great, like playing every week and you know when you're playing footy if you're playing every week you're so much happier i can't remember that feeling 
<laughs> but you'll get there one day. Yeah. You get there. But yeah, I was. Everything was great, and then I remember I think it was two weeks after Paddy was born, my brother rang me and said he he was in hospital. He got leukemia, so I was like, couldn't believe it. Um, and then I think it was it was three weeks after Paddy was born. Laura had um like her left side of her body was a bit numb after giving birth. So she went for an MRI and um do you know they found a brain tumor um which was I remember she went for her, her MRI and I was thinking hopefully like there's nothing there's nothing bad here because she was meant to have an MRI before she she got pregnant, but that was about something else. Um and I was babysitting Paddy at home. And she called me and said something showed up in the MRI. Can you come in with Paddy? So I, I went into hospital to, to them and, you know, I knew then I was think, on the way and I was thinking, this doesn't sound good, but I was trying to be positive. And, you know, he showed us the scan. He was like, there's there's um something showed up and they um needed the neuro um surgeons to, to have a look at it and stuff like that. And... From there, yeah, we we um went and seen a neurosurgeon and um he looked at the scan and he said that um he thought it, it, well he thought it was a stage three or four tumor which is high cancer um which was obviously the last thing you want to hear and he also said it was in a place that they couldn't operate on so the bear in mind. Me, Laura, and Paddy are in there. He's only three weeks old, um, and we're just I'm just sitting there thinking this, I can't be hearing. This can't be happening. Yeah, like, um, and then they he was nearly going to give us like a time, basically. He asked you, didn't he? he didn't he say, do you want to know how long she got yeah, left? We were going to be given a time, and remember saying I want the biopsy to be done first because. He said that, you know, this shortened your life significantly. So, yeah, from that, it was obviously the worst case. Um, rang the club and had told them. Um, because I'll go, I'll backtrack a bit, actually. When we first got the first MRI done, we had to wait to see the neurosurgeon. And we had an away game. And I remember we were down south at the time on the friday night and uh laura went to the doctor to confirm what it was I remember she rang me just as we got to the hotel and she said it it is a brain tumor like i'm gonna have to see the neurosurgeon um on monday so i was like oh my god i went for a walk and i remember uh models paul mullen um I was meant to get a robe and he was like, where are you? And I was like, oh, I'm just going for a walk. And he was like, is everything all right? And I was like, not really. So he came out and followed me basically and was like, what's going on? And I told him and he was like, go home. He was like, you need to go home. And um, then the gaffer came and I, t I told the gaffer and he was, he couldn't believe it because of what happened with my brother as well mm. and that. And we were trying to be as positive as, as we could until we obviously spoke to the neurosurgeon and got the, the worst news possible. Um, so, yeah, we, we went back to Ireland after we, we got the, the bad news to see family and because no one had seen Paddy uh, at this stage either and uh, we didn't know, Laura didn't know if it was going to be her last time going home or anything. Um, and it was just a, a crazy time looking back at it. Um, the part then was the the owner, like Ryan Reynolds, rang me and said that he heard heard the news and she'd obviously heard about Kevin, my brother, as well. And he says, I, can I please help get a second opinion? Um, which I was, of course, said, like, if you can help in any way, that would be great. Um, and then we spoke to a doctor from New York and he got, I sent the um, MRI uh, results and stuff to him and he sent the neurosurgeon over there. Um, and luckily he said to me that 
a few days after we'd been told the worst news that um you know he doesn't think it's adding up to what we were told which gave us hope basically because before from the last thing we heard was it could be months like or whatever um and we basically uh got hope from that and the biopsy was being done a few few days later so we got that done we had to wait a long time basically for for the results from that but luckily because of having the support from america um i was basically not co- not confident because they still weren't sure but we just had um hope that it's not going to be what they said it was and I think th- that would have waited for the full results from biopsy. It would have been the longest wait of, jeez, it would have been, I don't know, I can't imagine how it would have been for them few weeks, but um, having that hope made it, definitely made it easier, even though it wasn't easy, but thanks to the, the owners, you know, the, I don't think I'd have had that help anywhere else, but... Um, they were amazing, you know, speaking to me most days, asking how things were and just genuine good people that will we'll or me and my family friends will be forever grateful for that help. And on that, like obviously with Wrexham at the minute, because of like everything that's happening with Wrexham, everything's been so good and all that. Wrexham does get a lot of hate from jealous people know that not mm-hmm. wanting Wrexham to do well, but they won't see the side of the owners doing what they've done. And who knows what would have I don't know what would have been the case if Ryan didn't step in and get you the second opinion and would support you along this way because, like, obviously I was with you at the time and, uh, like, you was getting phone calls from, like, surgeons in New York and you were saying to him at the time, like, do you, do you want me to... You met him in the end, didn't you? You met the guy from New York or... Yeah, I did, yeah, in pre-season. Yeah. yeah. The doctor, yeah. Which, like, I couldn't imagine from, like, not slugging... The club's happy enough with the owners, but I just couldn't imagine like someone stepping in and helping, like as much as what the owners have done here with him. And like I can remember speaking to you at the time, and I remember saying like, "What is money for? Like, what is fame for? And like for the context that people will have if they're not going to help out in this situation? And mm-hmm. what is it all for? And he done it off his own back. Like he contacted you and done it off his own back, which a lot of people wouldn't see and. Like, obviously, as a mate for Fordy and Fordy's family, like, obviously, what they've done is unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's credit to them. Yeah, it's... We were so lucky, really, and, you know, it's... He's... The owners are unbelievable, and people looking in are like, oh, Hollywood this and that, and, you know, they're... Whatever, they're genuine, normal people that have a heart and like they're not arsed about all this exposure and plaudits and um you know i remember saying to ryan at the time like like i don't know how i'll ever thank you for for helping me and um he was like look people have helped me in the past too you know it just i think sometimes when you think people are famous and stuff they're just everything's like perfect or whatever but just shows how amazing for me he was to to me and Laura and stuff at the time. He was just unbelievable, and you know we we built a a relationship. Um, We're friends throughout that, and the doctor in Amer- in America. Um, you know we still speak to him now and stuff. And when we went to preseason the summer, we got to meet him, um, and it was amazing. You know just to to meet in person and. Him yeah, obviously, I, I've just gone through a similar experience having a child as well. Mm. Um, it's mentally tough, you know, as it is, you know, to especially if it's your first child. Um, yeah. you know, once you had that news and you know you're having to kind of be there and provide for your new for your new lad, your new baby, but also try and be there for your partner. How did you manage to juggle that? Because it seems, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sinking now, you know, with in good health, and obviously, mm. you know, it's new, it's new to me. But how did you manage to juggle 
all the emotions that he was having and, you know, the information that he was getting given, obviously, and then still having to try to be the best uh, father you can be for Paddy. Um, like, looking back now, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a blur um, because it was so crazy what was going on. But, you know, the, the club said step away and take as much time as you want. And they were amazing. The gaffer was unbelievable with me and my family and you know obviously I stepped away and I remember like Laura wanted me to continue playing and stuff but I don't think at the time she probably realized like it probably was affecting I wouldn't been able to perform on the pitch mm. with everything going on mm. like Absolutely. I wouldn't have even wanted to be around the lads and stuff because I wouldn't have been the same as usual um and I remember just stepping away and uh you know, it was, it was hard for me, but I just think like for her, she was just, she was breastfeeding at the time. She got the news, women's hormones are all over the place when they give birth and like she was after her biopsy, she was still trying to breastfeed. I remember John, you came me with like a breast pump to the hospital yeah. to us and stuff. And it was just, it was just all over the place, but. I don't know, I just look at her and think how how she coped was ridiculous. Superwoman, like, mate. Yeah. No, I honestly yeah. she must have some some resilience and obviously Yeah. Because I think as a partner of a footballer, especially living away from home, it's difficult as it is. You know, you know, you've got a new baby and you, you haven't got your mum or dad maybe round to kind of help it. Yeah. So and then as you say, you're using an away game when you got that information. Um so yeah, hats off to, to both years basically to, to be able to handle and get through that time. Yeah. Um unfortunately, obviously he's a coming you know, you're in a better position at the moment, yeah. aren't you? So Yeah, I think coming I think like Laura's sister came and stayed with us from, from Canada. She was a great help to us, you know, at the time and um one thing we tried to be was was positive, you know, through through everything and I remember like I remember some days and even some nights just like still not knowing and you're waking up crying during the night and you're like I was thinking like what's going through Laura said you know like there was just so many things with like little new baby and everything and um yeah it was the hardest obviously time of my life but it was also hard for friends and family because like people feel helpless and it's also affecting them um you know i remember um i didn't want to tell my parents about laura straight away until i got the the full news um because their stress from my brother's news then to go and tell him that as well i just was like until we know that there's a brain tumor there or whatever i'm not going and telling them and obviously I had to tell them eventually and um you know stepping away was definitely the right thing to do at the time um but we got updated results um weeks later there was a there was a long wait for results which having the hope from America the second opinion made it easier but when we got the updated results you know it came back that it was actually it was looking like a low grade tumor and um obviously i couldn't couldn't believe it mm. because what we were told so i've i've ring the doctor and said like this is amazing you know we've been told that it's looking like this but he can't fully confirm because the full results aren't back yet and then we went in for the full res results a few weeks later and a after the updated results i went back training and i remember thinking like you know, Laura wanted me to get back into a routine and it was also going to be good for me because it would kind of get things back to normal a little bit. Um, and I got, when we got the full results, um, you know, the, it was a low grade tumor that's not cancerous, um, which was the best case scenario. Um, so from like no treatment, it's just, uh, follow up MRIs like every six months from now on to to hopefully see no change and um hopefully it stays that way and you know from where we were 
it was it was trauma because what we were told and you know mentally i think that'll still be tough for for us and especially for laura but um yeah from where we were to where we are now it's you know totally different and we're so lucky that the results came back that way after what we were first told has your relationship got stronger has it changed in any way you, yeah is the like anything that's different you know as you say um i think it probably has got stronger yeah without us probably even noticing ourselves because we're together all the time but like i don't know i think i haven't having the baby made things um do you know i think sometimes I think things happen for a reason and he came and he was such a distraction at that time mm. and things was going on and uh that that helped make it easier as well but uh yeah look we we are we're in a, a lot better place now and hopefully it can continue to be to be good from now on yeah um like obviously you said before it was a blur but i can say on behalf of you and laura you were showing like so much strength and positivity and there was stuff that you were looking into all the time to try and help the tumor at this point where we thought it was a high grade and you were looking at everything and i remember speaking to you and you was like you're not sure whether this will work or anything but you was willing to try anything and there was a, a man in ireland that you went back to see um mm. can't remember what it was about but you weren't too sure whether you believed in it yourself or not but you had to try it because you was willing to do anything you could yeah we were looking into all sorts of things and um yeah just everything that you can i think when you get to to that stage and you know obviously after hearing the the first initial news we were just looking into everything and what can we do different what can diet wise what everything like um you know i don't think i've never prayed as much in my life and i know people around me like you were amazing in, in liverpool and your family and ellie's family and you know like seeing different sides of people for me from from that experience like i'll never forget you know what i mean and um i'm lucky to have such good friends and and my family at home um you know we were so so lucky to have that support and you know sometimes uh, saying this to the brain tumor charity followed followed us and they've been amazing to be fair um with laura and stuff and a lot of tumors are misdiagnosed which shouldn't happen uh, i know obviously <laughs> i'm not qualified to say things like that but like if you're in a bad state mentally and you're getting told such bad news like that, you know, people might be thinking differently, thinking, well, I could be dying. Yeah. Like, you know, they could have give up, do you know, they could give up, but there's, there's one message that I'd, I'd say is to be, try to be as positive as you can because everyone's different and, you know, not one person's the same as another because, um, things change quick and being positive was definitely massive in, in the time um we had i think that definitely helped us get through through a big part of it in the mix of all this it's march time rex are trying to get promoted you've got everything going on in your own personal life there's a battle between you and Notts county to get promoted to league two i'm sure of you so even though you wanted to be at home with paddy and laura and being the best dad and fiance that you could be you were still something in the back of your head wanting to try and get back into training if you was able to do so and try and help Wrexham get promoted. Your first half back, you scored a goal. I said at the time, like, things are just meant to happen. Talk us through getting back in play and getting promoted at the end of the season and how proud you are doing that. Yeah, I think getting back in training um, after being off for, for a few weeks was... I nearly got a heart attack on my first day back, to be honest. My heart rate was through the roof. I remember the sports scientists going, how do you feel? And I was like, yeah, I was blowing a bit. Like, they were like, your heart rate's like 199 or something. I was, I was fucked, to be fair. But, uh, yeah, I just got back in and 
you know, got got the head down and thought, I'll be ready if if I'm called upon. Yeah. But I know if I mightn't play because of I've missed a part in the team or have momentum. So I was just happy to be back in, and if if called upon, I'd be ready. And uh, yeah, we played Yeovil um, at home on Tuesday night. Um, you know, I think it's the third last game of the season, but we needed to, we needed to win. And it's funny because we got the full results of Laura's diagnosis that morning. And then that evening was the game. And I remember going to the, to the ground, the gaffer still hadn't named the team. And I went into his office when I got there before the game. And I said, I've, I just want to tell you that um, we got Laura's full results. And it's the best case scenario. And, you know, it's, it's a low grade tumor and it's amazing from, what we were first told and he was absolutely buzzing he goes look I have good news for you as well he said you're starting tonight and uh, I was just like right let's go whatever and um, yeah luckily got the first goal that night and we won 3-0 um, and yeah it was amazing and I was just buzzing I was able to come back and help the team yeah. um, get such an important win at the time to try to get us one step closer over the line. And, uh, yeah, I remember that was some feeling like I think doing the best I've had, to be fair. Yeah. I think the manager probably, at the end of that meeting, probably when you left, he knew you was on cloud nine. And he he, felt, he, he probably had in his mind, he's going to he's gonna play well here today. Mm -hmm. he, I think he had a good feeling about it. S saying things just happen in life and, you, you know, you never know why until it unfolds. But, um, mm -hmm. obviously, your story story is amazing as well. And... and to come back after such such a tough you know few months yeah. um and score kind of you know you see in other podcasts and uh, other conversations with athletes when when they're playing you know they're free obviously they've got all the things that are going on in the personal lives but you know for the time that they're on that pitch they yeah. you know not not that they forget about it but something just comes over them where like they turn into like you know true competitors and, and that's all that they're focused on is that what you was like when you was on the pitch or was you how was you feeling? Um, I can't remember really how I was feeling at the time. I remember just, Other than that, just trying to trying to perform as well as I could. I remember, you know what it's like when you don't play games for a while, you lose your sharpness. And mm. I just thought like... Why would I know that feeling? Ah, you do, John. It's not been that long. Um, but like, yeah, I just think... I don't know, I think it was, it was hard to look at it at the time. But looking back probably now, I probably appreciate it more do you know what I mean because it wasn't obviously just Laura's stuff my brother's stuff is going on at the same time and like luckily he's he's in remission now as well so he's uh he's in a lot better place than where he was as well but at a certain time we didn't know what was going on with both of them but um yeah look things things are good now and I'm coming back to help the team get promoted and I was so happy to score as well because I was like, I felt like that was like my thank you to to support yeah. that the club, the fans, the staff, the owner showed me. And um, yeah, I I was so happy after it just to, to come back and to contribute basically because when I was gone, obviously the last thing I thought about was I didn't, I did care about getting promoted, but when stuff that serious happens, football goes out the window, you know. But um, yeah, getting back into it and um, getting promoted in at the end of the season was was unbelievable for everyone at the club. Um, but if I never moved to Wrexham, would I've had the support I've had? No, I don't think so. Mm. And you know, it's just been a crazy year, like um, for my family, friends, everyone, and. I remember Laura saying, like, I have still have, when things were going on, she was like, I still have a vision of you holding Paddy at the end of the season when you get promoted on the pitch. And I remember thinking, like, all I wanted was that to happen then and things to be better. And it, it happened. And that was probably, that was probably one of the best, if not the best day of, of my career, even top of making my debut because of what went on and everything. Um, but, you know, we I remember going to games 
we went to one or two games when uh, I wasn't back. I was back training, but I wasn't back involved. And I remember Laura came and we, we went to meet like Ryan in his box before the game. And like the, all the fans started clapping me, Laura and Paddy, like, and she'd never felt that and like that. And she was like, Arf, she was like, this is just amazing. Like the standing up, clapping us as we walk past, like showing their support and something that I'll always be grateful for. And that's why a part of me that just wants to do as well as I, I can for this club because how well they've treated me as well. Fans, the fans are really good, to be honest. They're like a sleeping giant. And no. even when I played them last, I think it might have been 2017, 18, there was still that underlying feeling that they, they want to be higher, they deserve to be higher. And obviously, luckily, they've got, you know, the new owners who managed to help make that happen. But the fans were always there. And it was always kind of one of those grounds, because I played them in, in the National League, and it was always one of those grounds that you wanted to go to. Because yeah. uh, they did have that fan base, and it just met, it made you feel like you was playing higher up again. Yeah. Is that how you feel every week? Yeah, it is, yeah. And that's something I said when I first signed. It's like you could be playing in a championship game when you're, when you're at the race course. It's, the atmosphere is just a different level. And, you know, when when we're performing and the crowd gets behind you, there's, it's it's an unbelievable feeling there. Um, and you know what? We've had, since I've signed, it's been good times. And hopefully that continues this year now is it? again. This podcast is sponsored by Blythe House, financial advisors for high net worth individuals and business owners. If you're looking for advice in pensions, investments, mortgages, inheritance, tax planning, life cover, business loans, and asset finance, then Blythe House has the expertise for you. Head over to the show notes on whatever platform you're listening to this on to find out more. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to like and follow the page. Thank you. Yeah, so you you did get promoted on the celebrations. You just went to Vegas yeah. and got treated like you were Premier League footballers. Yeah. Talk us through that. Yeah, um, got taken to Vegas and uh, it was some experience. Just absolutely crazy. Um, so we never be able to do it ourselves like because <laughs> it was just not achievable but the owners went with you didn't they as well which uh yeah rob came with his wife and uh ryan didn't come but yeah it was it was amazing uh crazy place like but we were treated treated like kings yeah. um which is mad isn't it because it's vegas like it's it's huge it's massive and wrexham is obviously a smaller town or mm-hmm. is it is it a town or a village town it'll be a town and um like he's i was in america that summer as well and he was just sam posting like billboards of like wrexham and all i was thinking wrexham are fucking massive mate <laughs> but like he was walking into clubs and stuff like the music was stopping i was like wrexham everywhere and all that weren't it yeah it was and you know what like obviously none of us were like oh where the boys like you know because we know who we are mm. we're not special we're not big celebrities or anything but we just took it all in and just had the best few days ever and uh it was a hard season so to be able to celebrate all together and out there is just the best way to do it really um and we were lucky we we had the opportunity to that the the owners took us there and um yeah trip of lifetime yeah i'm looking forward to this year now obviously he's in a good position in the league um like in the back of your head, like from what the club has done for you and the support that you've had from the owners and all that, is it like you would, you basically want to end your career there? You don't want to play for anyone else. Like you want to give as much back to that football club and the owners as possible because of what they done for you when you was in a time of toughness. Yeah, no, definitely. It's uh, do you know we're doing well at the minute. Um, so long season to go yet, but um. We just need to keep the heads down, take game by game. But yeah, I absolutely love the club um, and want to be there as long as possible. Um, you know, just to, I really feel like it's a big part of, of me now. And What's the big things have happened in yeah. your life while you've been there? And so hopefully it continues as long as possible. And, you know, once, once we keep winning, that's the main thing and the club moving forward. Hopefully you can get that feeling of uh, 
Paddy Laura yourself back on the pitch. Oh, yeah. I guess that must have been uh, some feeling. Did you, did you know when you was there? Did you take it in? Did you feel like you know this is what we spoke about a few months ago? Um, we're here now. Yeah, I did. I remember um, you know on the pitch after and just I just remember being with the two of them on the pitch, thinking it's this is the time. It's hard to take things in when it happens. It's when you look back. Yeah, at exactly. It. And, yeah. You know, my family came over for it as well. My brother couldn't come, unfortunately, at the time. But, um, you know, my family were there and it was just for them to experience the the craziness of it. And the place was just wild that night after it. Um, we we had an amazing evening. But uh, I think when, when you achieve it after such a season... Um, it there's just no better feeling like and the lads it's such a good group group of lads as well and when you have such a good group it's it makes it makes it feel even better because we're all even closer now because of you know the promotion and spending time in america together and on pre-season you just we've got a really solid group there so that that makes a big difference to to a club would you say that so you said before i think to your most memorable moments in football was that celebration and then also your debut. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that would be the standout uh, for me, definitely. You got to choose one? I'd say um, with my family at the end of the game, right. getting promoted has to be. Yeah. Yeah, has to be. Um, so, yeah, amazing, amazing season. So, hopefully more good times to come like absolutely fingers crossed obviously you mentioned before you know coming come to like 30 now um football is obviously a career that doesn't last forever um we all have a sell by date as a footballer um have you started thinking about you know life after football are you wanting to stay in the game or are you just kind of on this roller coaster at the moment with Wrexham and just like putting all your concentration into that at the moment um yeah i i it's so hard to for me now even to say what I'm going to do I think I will stay in football because that's what I know best um but like a few years ago I did a sports science course and I stopped halfway through because I just thought it's not for me I'm not can't see myself doing it so um still at the at the minute I'm just focusing on on playing at Wrexham and I haven't really um decided what I'm going to do yet I, I think hopefully something pops into my head soon yeah. but uh at the minute i'm just gonna try try enjoy playing football and um but i still know you know like gonna have to do something after football and but it's finding what hopefully i enjoy um whether that be coaching agency any something like that um at the moment i'm not sure it's on on that um you said before about um Doing some work with the charity for brain tumor as well. Yeah. You was looking on doing that, weren't you? Yeah, we are looking at doing stuff. Um, you know, we haven't me and Laura haven't really planned anything at the minute because we've uh biz- things going on at home, whatever, like just day to day stuff with the baby that just don't have time to but we will definitely try to do a few bits to to help charity and, you yeah. know, raise more awareness yeah. because I don't think there's enough awareness for, for brain tumors. Thank you very much, Fordy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, boys. Nice one. Cheers.